Hello and welcome to Duly Noted. We are covering some of the uh, dorsal, ventral, rami and roots coming out of the spinal cord as well as their connections with sympathetics. We thought this uh, might be a little bit of a useful talk if you're not quite understanding how things work coming in and out of the spinal cord. We're covering just the basics, keeping things nice and simple. And if you want more complicated, we can certainly give that to you. But uh, for now, let's just cover some of the real key components of somatosensation, somatomotor, and uh, pre and post ganglionic sympathetics in their relationship to the body wall, as well as to some structures that go up to the head. So let's look at the key first, always starting at the key. We have here in black at the very top, a dotted line. You can see the arrow going to the left, uh, assuming that it's afferent going back uh, up away from the periphery and towards the central nervous system. This is presynaptic somatosensory, also known as general somatic afferent or GSA, and that's your primary pathway for the first order neuron. Like all sensation, it always synapses not on a ganglion, but always on a nucleus. And a nucleus, by definition, will be found in the CNS. It is a group of nerve cell bodies found in the central nervous system. So the solid line that you see here, it, we're gonna see at the nucleus today, which is gonna be the dorsal horn. And those are postsynaptic somatosensory for general somatic afferent. This is our second order neuron pathway. The dotted line in blue, in case you're colorblind, it's this one here. It's a little bit of a lighter shade than the top one. Uh, we can see that the arrow is now going to the right, assuming this is efferent. So this is presynaptic somatomotor, which never utilizes a ganglion at any time, and synapses as all somatosensation does on a nucleus. This nucleus today will be called the ventral horn, and this is our general sensory efferent primary pathway, our first order. The solid line you'll see will be a nucleus starting there and then heading out through ventral rootlets, ventral root, spinal nerve, ventral rami, and this will be a postsynaptic somatomotor pathway and general sensory, or sorry, general somatic efferent is what it's called. That's our second order. In the red, the lower ones that we see here, we have a dotted line that's presynaptic, and here is where we synapse on a ganglion, a collection of nerve cell bodies in the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. The presynaptic sympathetic pathway is called general visceral efferent, and our first order pathway will synapse on a ganglion. Our first solid line will be seen here at a ganglion, again, still efferent, the arrow pointing to the right, postsynaptic sympathetics traveling with general visceral efferent pathways to their second order pathway. So this is our key. And now let's start by just looking at the spinal cord. The spinal cord here, we're just gonna pick a level and we can see that we have dorsal horns. Notice the solid black line. This solid black line indicates there is a second order nerve cell body here and we're gonna send that pathway up to our third order neuron, which is typically the thalamus, and then send it up to our postcentral gyrus and posterior part of our paracentral lobule. For the ventral horn, you can see there's something synapsing here. Our ventral horn of the spinal cord is where our second order neuron is, or the lower motor neuron. Our synapse is located here and will pass efferently out our pathway that we'll discuss. What synapses here is a dotted line. You can see the precentral gyrus and paracentral lobules anterior portion. It travels down something called the posterior limb of the internal capsule, decusates at the level of the pyramids, and it goes to the opposite side of the body down something called the lateral cortical spinal tract, where it will synapse on the ventral horn. Note the ventral horn is a dark blue solid line because the synapse has occurred, making this pathway postsynaptic somatomotor. The dotted line that you see here is only present from T1 to L2, which I've put to the right. The lateral horn is where we find our presynaptic sympathetic nerve cell bodies. So let's pick a pathway, any pathway, and trace it out. We can see that we have dorsal roots, we have ventral roots, with their respective rootlets coming from their areas or going to their areas of ventral horn, dorsal horn, respectively. The spinal nerve is very short, and we'll see it branches into ventral rami and dorsal rami. 
Think of a root being rooted in one modality. Think of a ramus being like an arm. You have two of those, so they'll typically have two modalities. Sympathetics will also hitchhike on our ventral and dorsal rami. We mostly have a relationship with the ventral rami, but they can also hitchhike onto the dorsal rami uh, as they need to go to the back to innervate skin. So let's be super specific here. And I'll trace that and talk about that pathway for you. There we go. Perfect. So let's just pick a pathway and just talk about sensation. Everybody feel the lateral part of your arm, the lateral part of your arm. And that area is mostly C5, spinal nerve innervated. So as you brush your skin, there are receptors there and then travel through an area called the axillary nerve, which is a fancy way to basically send information back. Now, if we're going back up through this pathway, we're gonna pick the axillary nerve, which is a ventral set of rami, C5, C6. Let's say it's the C5 major level. We'll travel through the C5 ventral, ventral ramus level at the axillary nerve. We'll bypass the sympathetic chain without really communicating yet. We'll come back up through the ventral ramus. See this efferent, I'm sorry, afferent pathway that's black. We'll travel up to the spinal nerve at C5, and then we're gonna go rooted into one modality, which is somatosensation, pain, temperature, touch, vibration. We'll come up to our dorsal root ganglion where there is no synapse. It's basically a house of nerve cell bodies outside of the CNS. We'll deem it worthy of our reception by then taking it in to the rest of the dorsal root where we'll synapse via the dorsal rootlets onto the dorsal horn. If deemed worthy, we'll go up through, via this second order neuron and then synapse on the thalamus and then head over to the post central gyrus or the posterior part of the paracentral lobule of the parietal lobe. Now let's talk about efferent pathways. Let's say I wanna move that same arm. Let's say it's the deltoid at that same level of C5. We'll start on the paracentral lobule of the frontal lobe. We'll then send our way, oh, I'm sorry, the, um, sorry, precentral gyrus. Paracentral lobule is for lower extremity. Precentral gyrus is for more upper extremity. Anything basically but lower. We'll travel on our precentral gyrus onto that area called the posterior limb of the internal capsule. We'll then travel over to the pyramids where we'll decusate to the other side of the body and then travel on the lateral cortical spinal tract to head over to our ventral horn where we will synapse. Then to head out, we need to get out to that same axillary nerve. So we travel on ventral rootlets, out through the ventral root, come over to our spinal nerve, and then head over to the ventral ramus that we'll call the axillary nerve when it joins up with C6 ventral ramus. We'll send that area out to the myoneural junction at the deltoid and we'll be able to abduct our arm. Now, we also have sympathetics that are pre and post ganglionic and they have to utilize mostly the ventral ramus in order to communicate with the sympathetic chain. So the hypothalamus is really stimulating a lot of the sympathetic activity through endocrine system and through these very complicated tracts. So let's keep it simple and assume that the hypothalamus has stimulated us. We have four possible outcomes once we come to the chain, which we will get to. This key here is just for sympathetics and that's why it's in red. Let's say that you want to make that same arm sweat. You, need, you have sweat glands there, right? So let's say you're running, you're running, you need to sweat. So let's send information out through the lateral horn at the level of C5, C6 area for our outcome, but all the sympathetics have to come from T1 to L2. So we're gonna need to go from our lateral horn. We need to come over and travel on the ventral rootlets out to the ventral root. We need to go to the spinal nerve and then go on to a ventral ramus. That's the red that you see here. Then we have to somehow get to the sympathetic chain. So we jump on this oblique fiber called the white rami communicans. This white ramus will take us over to the sympathetic chain. And since we need to get up to C5 and C6, we'll go up the chain and synapse on a ganglion. And then we travel out through our ventral ramus that we know as the axillary nerve, C5, C6, 
and then head out to sweat glands that go to the skin that the same nerve supplies for general sensory afferent. Just think if the skin is supplied with afferents, it also is supplied with sweat glands. So sweat, that glandular activity, is sympathetically driven. Now, let's say that we want to go out the same level to the armpit and make it sweat. We can come out the T1 level, go onto a lateral horn, go over to our ventral rootlets, travel on our ventral root, go over to our spinal nerve, and travel on the ventral ramus of T1. White ramus communicans, this pathway will never change. And then we can synapse at the same level, take our gray ramus communicans back to our ventral ramus, and then head out to go over to the intercostal brachial nerve, and also to the medial brachial cutaneous nerve which will innervate the armpit area. Now we can also decide to ascend that chain or descend that chain at multiple levels. Let's say my forehead is sweating, right? Or my cheeks and my face are sweating. In order to get there, I'm going to have to still come from T1, go over for my lateral horn cell, go over to my ventral rootlets, to my ventral root, to my spinal nerve, to a ventral ramus, and take a white rami communicans. Notice it's dotted. That pathway never changes. Now let's go up, 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 up to our most superior ganglion called the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion. No, there are no gray rami here because we have no ventral rami to jump onto. The gray ramus communicans is a solid line that carries us back to the ventral ramus. So how in the head do we get to our sight? How do we dilate our pupils? How do we make our face sweat? How do we stop parasympathetic flow? Well, if we're outside of the body, we'll travel on the external carotid plexus. If we are going inside the head, we'll travel to the internal carotid plexus. For my face, I'm gonna to go to the external carotid plexus because it gives rise over to the facial artery. It'll carry those post-ganglionic sympathetics over to my face, to the skin, to innervate the sweat glands. Notice the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion, all these chain ganglia are a solid line because our synapse has occurred. Now, what if I wanted to actually make my feet sweat? Well, I know the bottom of my foot is innervated mostly by L5, but I don't actually have an L5 lateral horn level. So now I'm gonna to have to go down the chain without synapsing and get to a distal ganglion. So the same thing occurs, same pathway for sympathetics, it never changes. Lateral horn cell, two ventral rootlets, two ventral root, two spinal nerve, to ventral ramus, to white ramus communicans, to the sympathetic chain. But now I go down, 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 I keep going down the sympathetic chain until I get to my ventral ramus that goes to the bottom of my foot, which will be tibial nerve. Now I'm gonna take a gray ramus communicans, notice it's dark, it's postsynaptic, and I'm gonna take that over to a ventral ramus and note the postsynaptic pathway travels on the ventral ramus that we'll call sciatic nerve, then goes to tibial nerve, and then goes to the bottom of my foot to make it sweat. One last outcome of sympathetics means we will leave the chain without synapsing. So this would be things like, wow, I'm sweating through my armpit, I'm sweating through my face, I'm sweating through my feet, and now I need to stop digestion. So it's fight or flight. I need to decrease my digestive capacity. Let's say I want to make my stomach decrease its actual churning of my food. We'll come from T5 to T9 lateral horn cells. We'll go out through those respective ventral rootlets, through that ventral root, to the spinal nerves from T5 to T9, through the ventral ramus levels, T5 to T9, taking the white ramus communicans because again, this sympathetic pathway never really changes. Then we're going to actually leave the chain without synapsing. Note the dotted line here. These are called splanchnic nerves. Good examples of those are greater, lesser, least, and lumbar splanchnics. Splanchnic means organ. These are going out to organs. The greater that you see here are the T5 to T9 that coordinate with my stomach. They're going to go over to the pre-aortic ganglion. This respective one would be called the celiac ganglion because it's flanking the celiac artery, a pre-aortic branch. So these ganglia are where our synapse occurs, and then if we're being really, really detailed, we'll go out through these different plexuses. This particular one would be called a celiac plexus. 
We also have inferior mesenteric plexus, superior mesenteric plexus, aortical renal plexuses, but it'll go out through a plexus to get to its respective organ. For my case, it would be the stomach to stop my digestion. Now, what about the skin of the back? The skin of the back doesn't use ventral rhema. It uses dorsal rhema. Well, how does it get there? I want to make my back sweat. I have to go from T1 to L2 again, lateral horn cells, to the ventral rootlets, ventral root, spinal nerve, ventral ramus, white ramus communicans, because this pathway never changes for sympathetics. And now we synapse, use a gray ramus to get back on our ventral and then loop over to our dorsal ramus. And you can see the solid line here. In actuality, these two things are very, very close together. And so the ventral ramus will then have to take the gray ramus over because the dorsal ramus doesn't have those. And so since they're close together, it will travel on the dorsal ramus to get out to the skin of my back. So those are the major outcomes of the sympathetics. They have to use this amazing pathway that's presynaptic that never changes. We have 14 of these white rami communicans on average and 30 some of these gray rami communicans. So the gray rami are every time you have a ventral ramus, you have a gray ramus. So if you think about it, you have seven in the cervical spine, you have 12 in the, or sorry, eight in the cervical spine, you have 12 in the thoracic spine, that makes 20. And then you have five in the lumbar and five in the sacral. So, and if you have a coccygeal segment, that's 31. You have 30 plus gray rami communicants, but only 14 white rami communicants. If you're having trouble remembering, remember the white is how your day starts out because it's pre-day. And at the end of the day, your white shirt turns gray because it's used, right? So it's a great way to remember that myelinated, very fast white rami communicants quickly trying to get to their spot to synapse. And the gray taking the slow way because they're demyelinated. The gray rami always utilize ventral rami to get out to their spots. As I've noted here, that's usually the body wall for somatic structures also. Basically sweating, going out to body wall structures. But we can also go out through the carotid plexuses and then head out to not use ventral rami at all to go out to structures in the head. They have to travel on arteries to get there because there are no ventral rami at the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion level. And then of course we can always leave the chain without synapsing, head over to preaortic ganglia and head out to a respective plexus. So hopefully you found this useful to study both the afferent, efferent pathways that are somatic as well as the efferent pathway that is going to be more of our sympathetics. Now remember, your sympathetics can also deliver general sensory, or sorry, general visceral afferents. So we have visceral afferent pathways that actually take this GSA pathway. So organs can actually feel in a way, but they don't really feel a lot of sharp pain. But there is a dull sense, but it travels basically back to our dorsal horn to synapse. So in case you need to study that more, you can actually start with the basics and then start to look at your patterns for referred pain which we can do in a separate video. Hopefully you found this useful and we'll see you next time for our next discussion on basic neurology of the human body.